Hey guys, Victoria Paxton here. Thanks for stopping back by my YouTube channel. We're going to talk about the Beaumont children. Hey guys, okay, this is for entertainment purposes only. Everything encompassing this video belongs to me. If you want to share it out to your friends, that's fine. But if anyone copies it or does anything illegal, then I'm going to have to do what I have to do. You know I hate saying that. Okay, so this is going to be a really long one. First of all, oh my gosh, you guys, here we go. <gasps> Super Bowl champs. My Chiefs did it, you guys. They pulled it off. I'm so excited. <laughs> I watched the parade today online. Yes, I did. I'm a true fan. Even if they would have lost, it wouldn't have mattered. But it, it was so nice that they won. <laughs> you know. Okay. So this is a long one, guys. Get a drink, kick back. I hate, this is the part I hate most about doing videos, is having to read all this. But there's a reason why I have to read all this, okay? So Jane, Arna, and Grant Beaumont lived with their parents. Grant, who actually went by the name Jim, um, a former serviceman and driver for suburban taxis, and Nancy Beaumont, they married in December of 1955. Their house was located at 109 Harding Street in Somerton Park, which is a suburb of Adelaide, South Australia, not far from Glen Elk, Glen Elk, Glen Elk Beach. I probably butchered that. I'm sorry to the people there. <laughs> a popular spot that the children and many others at the height of the surf music era often visited. On December, nope, <laughs> on January 25th, in the midst of a summer heat wave, Jim dropped the children off at Glen, Elk, Glen Elk Beach before heading off on a three-day sales trip to Snowtown. Snowton? I don't know. On the morning of January 26, 1966, the children asked, asked their mother to visit Glen Elk, Glen Elk Beach again. As it was too hot to walk, they took a five-minute, three-kilometer bus journey from their home to the beach. They caught the bus at 8.45 a.m. and were expected home on the 12 noon bus. Nancy became worried, however, when the children did not return on either the 12 noon or the 2 p.m. buses. And when Jim returned home early from his trip around 3 p.m., he immediately drove to the crowded beach. Unable to locate his children, he returned, he returned home and together they searched the streets and visited friends' homes. Around 5.30 p.m., they went to the Glen Elk Police Station to report the disappearance. Police quickly organized a search of Glen Elk Glen Elk Beach and the adjacent areas based on the assumption that the children were nearby and had simply lost track of time. The search then expanded to the Sand Hills Ocean and near, no, Sand Hills and nearby buildings with the airport, rail lines and interstate roads being monitored as well based off of an accident or a kidnapping. Within 24 hours, the entire nation was aware of this case. You guys, that's huge because back then we didn't have the internet, right? So that's huge that, that they were able to get the word out quickly. Within three days on January 29th, the Adelaide Sunday Mail led with a headline of sex crime now feared, highlighting the rapidly evolving fear that they had been abducted and murdered by a sex offender. Despite this, the official reward was only 250 pounds. The Patawalonga Boat Haven was drained on January 29th after a woman told police she had spoken with three children who were similar in description to the Beaumont children near, near the haven at 7 p.m. on January the 26th. Police cadets and members of the emergency operation group searched the area, but nothing was found. Police investigating the case found several witnesses who had seen the children in Kali Reserve near Glenel Beach in the company of a tall man with fair to light brown hair and a thin face and in his mid thirties. He had a suntan complexion and a thin to athletic build and was wearing swimming trunk trunks. The children were playing with him and appeared to be relaxed and enjoying themselves. The man also approached one of the witnesses asking if anyone had be been near the children's belongings as their money had gone missing. The man then went off to, went off to change while the children waited for him. The group were then seen walking together away from the beach sometime later, which the police estimated to be around 12.15 p.m. The Beaumont parents described their children, particularly Jane, as shy. 
for them to be playing so confidently with a stranger seemed so out of character. Investigators theorized that the children had perhaps met the man during a previous visit or visits and had grown to trust him. A chance remark at home, which seemed insignificant at the time, supports this theory. Anna had told her mother that Jane had got a boyfriend down by the beach. Nancy thought she met a playmate and took no further notice until after their disappearance. A shopkeeper at nearby Winsell's Bakery also reported Jane had bought pasties and a meat pie with a one pound note. I think that's how you say it, a one pound note. Police viewed this as further evidence that the children had been with another person for two reasons. The shopkeeper knew the children well from previous visits and reported that the children had never purchased a meat pie before and the children's mother had given them only six shillings and six pence, which was enough for their bus fare and lunch and not one, one pound. I believe that's how you say it. <laughs> Police believe the money had been given to them by somebody else. According to an initial statement, the Beaumont children were seen walking alone at about 3 p.m. away from the beach along Jetty Road in the direction of their home. The witness, the postman, knew the, knew the children well and his statement was regarded as reliable. He said the children were holding hands and laughing in the main street. Police could not determine why the reliable children, already one hour late, were strolling along and seemingly unconcerned. This was the last confirmed sighting of the children. The postman contacted police two days after his initial statement and said he thought he had seen the children in the morning and not in the afternoon as he had previously stated. A local resident, Ms. Daphne Gregory, reportedly sighted the children at 3 p.m. with a man who carried an airlines bag, similar to one that was owned by Jane Beaumont. Several months after the disappearance, a man accompanied by two girls and a boy entered a neighboring house that was believed to be empty. Later, she had seen the boy walking alone along a lane where he was pursued and roughly caught by the man. The next morning, the house appeared to be deserted again, and she saw neither the man nor the children again. Police could not establish why she failed to provide this information earlier. Um, hello, why didn't you call the police? Like, what the hell? <sighs> the Beaumont case attracted international attention. On November 8th, 1966, Gerard Crusay, a Dutch psychic, was brought to Australia to assist in the search, causing media frenzy. Crusay's efforts proved unsuccessful, with his story changing from day to day and offering no clues. He identified a spot at a warehouse near the children's home in which he believed their bodies had been buried inside the remains of an old brick kiln. The property owners, who were reluctant to evacuate based only on a psychic's claim, soon bowed to public pressure after publicity helped raise $40,000 to have the building demolished. No remains nor any evidence linking to any of the Beaumont children was found. In 1996, the building identified by Crusay was undergoing partial demolition and the owners allowed for a full search of the site. Once again, no trace of the children was found. About two years after their disappearance, the Beaumont parents received two letters. One was supposedly written by Jane and another by a man who said he was keeping the children. The envelope sh envelopes showed a postmark of Dandenong, Victoria. The brief notes described a relatively pleasant existence and referred to the man who was keeping them. Police believed at the time that the letters could quite likely have been authentic after comparing them with others written by Jane. The letter from the man said that he had anointed himself guardian of the children and was willing to hand them back to their parents. In the letter, a meeting place was determined. The Beaumont parents, followed by a detective, drove to the designated place, but nobody showed up. It was some time later that the third letter arrived, supposedly from Jane, stating that the man had realized a disguised detective was present, present and that he decided to keep the children because the Beaumonts had betrayed his trust. Are you freaking kidding me? What kind of sicko would do that to, to parents? I mean, oof. There were no further letters after that. In 1992, new forensic examinations of the letters showed they were a hoax. Fingerprint technology had improved, and the author was identified as a 41-year-old man who had been a teenager at the time and had written the letters as a joke. Because of the time that had elapsed, he was not charged with any offense. You're lucky, kid. You're so lucky. In November 2013, excavation was initiated in the back of a North Plimpton factory that had once belonged to a possible suspect in the case, Harry Phipps. 
Further excavation at a slightly different location on the site was undertaken in February of 2018, but nothing relevant was found. The excavations were based on two men reporting that as boys, they had, they had been paid to dig a hole in that area around that time and also based on geophysical testing, which had identified disturbed soil. Animal bones were found, but nothing in relation to the Beaumont children. Bevan Spencer von Einem was sentenced to life in prison in 1984 for murdering 15-year-old Richard Kelvin, son of an Adelaide newsreader, Rob Kelvin. Police and prosecutors publicly stated that they believed von Einem had accomplices and was possibly involved in additional murders. About this same time, police came to suspect von Einem of possible involvement in the Beaumont cases. No accomplices were ever charged. Here we go. Von Heinem has refused to cooperate with investigators about his possible connection with other murders. During the investigation into Von Heinem, police heard from an informant identified only as Mr. B. He related an alleged conversation in which Von Heinem boasted of having taken three children from a beach several years earlier and said he had taken them home to conduct experiments. Von Heinem had said that he performed brilliant surgery on each one of them and had connected them up. One of the children had supposedly died during the procedure, and so he had killed the other two and dumped all the bodies in Bushland, south of Adelaide. Police had not previously considered Von Einem in connection with the Beaumont children, but he somewhat resembled the descriptions from 1966. According to Adelaide Police Detective Bob O'Brien, Mr. B gave important information during the investigation into the Kelvin murder and was regarded as a generally reliable source. However, police reception of the alleged confession was mixed. There were enough plausible details to warrant further research, yet other details relayed by Mr. B did not fit with known facts that were regarded with skepticism by police. As of 2014, Von Einem had not been ruled out as a suspect. While Von Einem was known to have frequented Glen Glenelg Beach to perv, on the changing rooms and was described as preoccupied with children, what argues against his involvement in the Beaumont case is that he was younger than the suspect seen with the children in 1966. The suspect was reported to be in his late, mid to late 30s, whereas Von Item was 20 or 21 at the time. Another important distinction is that he was convicted of murdering 15, a 15 year old boy and suspected of killing males in their teens and 20s victims older than the Beaumont children or Joanne Ratcliffe and Kirsty Gordon. Such disparities amongst victims of a serial killer are not unheard of, but are unusual. The reference to surgical experimentation Von Item had purportedly made to Mr. B also corresponded to the coroner's reports on several of the murdered youths. Von Item also told the witnesses that he had taken two girls from the Adelaide Oval during a football match, as Ratcliffe and Gordon had been, he said he had killed them, but did not elaborate. The cases of the Beaumont children and of the Adelaide Oval abductions remain officially open. However, Von Item matched the police sketches of the suspect in both the Beaumont and the Oval cases. And in 1989, he was identified as a suspect in a confidential police report. In August of 2007, it was reported that the police were examining archival footage from the original Beaumont search shot by Channel 7 that shows a young man resembling Von Item among onlookers. The report said that the police were calling for information to establish, excuse me, the man's identity. Okay, you guys, here we go. Arthur Stanley Brown, born in 1912, died in 2012, was charged in 1998 with the murders of sisters Judith and Susan McKay in Townsville, Queensland. They had disappeared on their way to school on August 26, 1970, and their bodies were found found several days later in a dry creek bed. Both girls had been strangled. Brown's July 2000 trial was delayed after his lawyer applied for a Section 613 verdict, unfit to be tried from the jury. He was never retried as he was found to have dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Brown died in 2002. Along with Von Item, Brown is considered to be the most likely suspect for the Beaumont abductions as he bore a striking resemblance to an identikit picture of the suspect for both the Beaumont and the Oval cases. A search for a connection to the Beaumonts was unsuccessful as no employment records existed that could shed light on Brown's movements at the time. Some of the records were believed lost in the 1974 Brisbane flood. It is also possible 
that Brown, who had unrestricted access to government buildings, may have destroyed his own files. Although there is no proof that he ever visited Adelaide, a witness recalled having a conversation with Brown in which he mentioned having seen the Adelaide Festival Center nearing completion, which would place him in the city shortly before the Oval abduction on August 25, 1973. However, no evidence has ever been found to connect Brown with Adelaide in 66. Brown was 53 at the time of the Beaumont disappearances, which does not match the description of the suspect seen with the children who was reported as being in his 30s. James O'Neill was born in 1947. In 1975, he was sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of a nine-year-old boy in Tasmania. He's reported to have previously told the Kimberley station owner and several other acquaintances that he was responsible for the Beaumont disappearances. In 2006, O'Neill lost an injunction in the High Court of Australia to stop the broadcast of an ABC documentary, The Fisherman, which attempted to link him to the Beaumont case. Former Victorian detective Gordon Davey spent three years speaking to O'Neill to win his confidence before filming him for the documentary. Davey said that although there was no evidence to link O'Neill to the Beaumont case, he was persuaded that O'Neill was to blame. I asked him about the Beaumonts and he said, I couldn't have done it. I was in Melbourne at the time. That is not a denial. Later, asked again if he had murdered the children, O'Neill replied, Look, on legal advice, I'm not going to say where I was or when I was there. Although O'Neill claims never to have visited Adelaide, his work in the opal industry at the time required that he frequently visit Cooper Petty, which would have required which would have required which would have required him to pass through Adelaide. Davy also suspected O'Neill was involved in the Adelaide Oval abductions. The South Australian police have interviewed O'Neill and discounted him as a suspect in the Beaumont case. Okay, Derek Percy, born in 1948, convicted child killer and Victoria's then longest serving prisoner was suggested in a 2007 article in Melbourne's The Age as a Suspect in the Beaumont case. The Age alleged that evidence gathered by cold case investigators indicated that Percy was a likely suspect for a number of unsolved child murders, including the Beaumont children. His insanity plea in the 1969 murder of Yvonne Tuohy was at least partially partly based on a <laughs> partly based on his suffering a psychological condition that could prevent him from remembering details of his actions. He was supposed to have indicated that he believed he might have killed the Beaumont children as he was in the area at the time, but he had no recollection of actually doing so. On August 30th, 2007, Victoria Police successfully applied for permission to question Percy in relation to the Beaumont case. In 1966, Percy was age 17 and therefore seems too young to have been the man seen by the children, seen with the children by several witnesses. It is also unknown whether Percy would have had a car at the time, while the Beaumont suspect is presumed by commentators to have had access to one for have had access to a vehicle for facilitating a quick getaway and also for disposing of the children's bodies later. Percy was in prison from 1969 until his death in 2013, which means that he could not have been the suspect in the Adelaide Oval abductions, whom many investigators believe to be connected with the Beaumont disappearance. Alan Maxwell McIntyre, who had himself been investigated by police and cleared of involvement in the Beaumont case, gave a secondhand account to the Adelaide Advertiser that a man he had known in 1966, who by 2015 was being sought in Southeast Asia in connection with child abuse incidents there, had come to his home with the children's bodies in the boot of his car. McIntyre's children said that they and their father initially mistook Arna's body for that of a boy because of her short haircut. The man in question was later identified as businessman Alan Anthony Monroe. Uh, he was 75 years old in 2017, a former scoutmaster who had pleaded guilty to 10 child sex, sex offenses dating back to 1962. For these crimes, he was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment with a non-parole period of five years and five months, making him eligible for release in 2022. In June of 2017, Adelaide detectives were given a copy of a child's diary written in 1966, which allegedly placed Monroe in the vicinity of Glen Elk Beach at the time of the Beaumont disappearance. He was convicted of abusing several children, including one of, the, of McIntyre's sons, who was a contributor to the diary. 
Monroe had been previously investigated by police, but no evidence had been found that he was involved in the Beaumont case. Okay, Harry Phipps. A local factory owner and then member of Adelaide's social elite came to attention as a possible suspect after the publication of the book, The Satin Man, Uncovering the Mystery of the Missing Beaumont Children in 2013. The book did not name the identi identity of the Satin Man, but Phipps' estranged son, Hayden, named him soon after the book's publication. Phipps bore a substantial likeness to the identikit of the, of the man seen talking to the Beaumont children at Glenelg Beach. He was wealthy and known to be in the habit of giving out one pound notes, was later alleged to have tendencies, and lived only 300 meters away from the beach at the corner of Augusta Street and Sussex Street. Hayden, who was age 15 at the time of the disappearance, came forward to researchers in 2007 with the claim that he had seen the children in his father's yard that day. Two other persons who were youths at the time said that they had been paid by Phipps to dig a two by one by two meter hole in his factory yard that weekend for unstated reasons. In November 2013, a one meter squared section of a factory in North Plimpton, which had been owned by Phipps, was excavated. Ground penetrating radar found one small anomaly which can indicate movement or objects within the soil, but the dig found no additional evidence and investigations into the site were closed. On January 22nd, 2018, Adelaide detectives announced that they, would, that they would return to the factory site and conduct further excavations. After a private investigation sponsored by Channel 7 Adelaide, okay, the excavation on February 2nd, 2018 took nine hours. Animal bones and general rubbish were found, but nothing related to the Beaumont case. Hey guys, this is future Victoria here. <clears throat> Excuse my voice, I don't know what the heck's going on. I wanted to come in and add a few things that I should have talked about on the original video. So, all right, so let's get going. So in 1973, two children, Joanne Ratcliffe, who was 11, and Kirsty Gordon, uh, she was four, disappeared from the Adelaide Oval during a football match, and they were presumed to have been abducted and murdered. Ratcliffe's parents and Gordon's grandmother had allowed the girls to leave their group to go to the bathroom. They were seen several times in the 90 minutes after leaving the Oval, apparently distressed and in the company of an unknown man, but they vanished after the last reported sighting. The police sketch of the suspect re resembles that of the man last seen with the Beaumont children, but it is not a satisfactory identical image. Detectives believe the cases may be linked. Okay, in 1979, the badly mutilated body of a young man was found in Adelaide, later identified as Neil Muir, 25, in 1982. I'm sorry, Neil Muir, who was 25. In 1982, the similarly mutilated body of Mark Langley, who was 18, was found. Before his death, he had been subjected to surgery. Okay, his abdomen had been sliced open and part of his bowel had been removed. So, over the next few months, more bodies were found. <clears throat> the dismembered skeletal remains of Peter Stogniff, who was 14 at the time, were found almost a year after the disappearance of Alan Barnes, who was 18, who was found mutilated in a similar manner to Langley. A fifth victim, Richard Calvin, 15, was found in 1983 once again with the same mutilations. Von Item was convicted of Calvin's murder in 1984 and was charged with the murders of Barnes and Langley in 1969, I'm sorry, 1989. However, the prosecution was forced to either uh, enter a null prosecute, which is unwilling to pursue, um, when crucial evidence was deemed inadmissible in court. These crimes have been known collectively as the family murders. Police believe that a core group of four people and up to eight associates were involved. Testimony given during Von Item's trial alleged he was involved in both the Beaumont and Oval abductions. Okay, so I was able to connect with the oldest of the three kids, which was Jane. Um, when she came through, she, you know, looked like a, what, fourth grader, you know. 
Um, and I've explained this before, but a lot of times um, they come through at the, when they were their happiest, okay? So her not ever making it to be an adult in this life, you know, would explain why I'm seeing her as a child. So I explained who I was. She talked about that she sees her siblings, her mom, her grandparents. I mean, she's got a lot of family there. Um, I asked her if she would be willing to talk to me about what happened um, at the end. And she got really upset at first and was trying to pull away. Like she didn't, even, she didn't want to talk about y'all. Like not at all. Okay. So I kind of calmed her down, got her to talk about some other things. And I said, look, you don't have to go into specifics. I understand, you know. Um, I said, can you tell me about this guy? The guy who did it. She said that they had met him a long time before this. So I don't know what that means. Um, and that they had seen him whenever they would go to Glen Elk, Glen Elk Beach. They would see him. Um, well, she didn't, she didn't say Glen Elk Beach. She said whenever they went to go swimming, I think is how she put it, that they would, you know, the three of them would see him. And she said they went that day, um, they saw him, they waved, they went in th into the water to play, they came back and they were going through their stuff and the money, their money had disappeared. And they were really upset. And he jumped in and said, oh no, no worries, it's okay. You know, trying to be like a superhero. I got you, here, I got you. Um, and they trusted him because uh, he had, you know, he'd always been nice to them, okay? These are little kids, guys. So I said, can you tell me his name? And she said, he said, he said his nickname was Art. But he told us at one time his name was Alan. So... I'm inclined, based on what she said, to think that his real name was probably Alan, you know, and he slipped up because she said that he had always, you know, he had always told him to call him Art, but then he had said at one point that his name was Alan. So she said he went to get changed. He came back and he said, okay, follow me. Let's go to my house. I'll take care of it. Don't worry. I'll give you money. Well, they ended up in a house, and she said it wasn't like a normal house. There was trash everywhere. Um, she said, you know, he didn't have a key for the door. She said, you know, it just, they went into a, like a back door. So I'm thinking it was probably like an abandoned house. Um, she said she didn't want to talk about anything else concerning that. Um, she said that, you know, she knows that, he grabbed her around the neck and she was having a hard time breathing, but she wouldn't talk anymore about, you know, anything about him. Um, I asked her, I said, well, you don't see him where you are now. And she's like, no, no, you know, I wish I had more details, but you guys, it, I believe it was this Alan guy. I really believe that he had slipped up like I I believe that was probably his real name and he goofed right so Alan Anthony Monroe I believe that's who it was um yeah um fortunately for the world he died in 2017 um I really believe that's who it was, you guys. I was getting the name Alan before I even did this case. Um, I really believe that's that's who did it. I mean, I'm pretty confident. Um, now, I asked if she knew where this guy put their body, and she said no. She just, she was a child, you know, so I didn't want to push her any more than what I'd already pushed, you know? Um, cause it was really upsetting to her, you know, 
but I know that was a lot of information, but I felt like I needed to read all that because of the information that I got. I felt like it was, a, it was pertinent, you know? Wow, you guys, you didn't tell me. How come you didn't tell me how bad my, how bad my blush looked? You guys should have told me. Like, hello. <laughs> you got to tell me next time. Sorry about that, guys. So I look a little bit like a clown. That's okay. I'm okay with that. Okay, so when I um, was going through all of this, I, you know, a lot of times I just get, I'm just given information, and there were a few things that I received, okay? Um, the Joan Rat, Clifton, Kirstie Gordon um, case, um, without a doubt, I feel, was the same person that abducted the Beaumont children, okay? So I definitely think those are related. Um, the family murders, as they're called, of uh, the young men that were found mutilated, I don't believe that, <clears throat> that the man... Um, that little Jane told me about, I don't believe him to be the same man that killed, that mutilated these boys, okay? So I believe Joanne Ratcliffe and Kirstie Gordon, those two young girls, I believe their killer and the Beaumont children killer are in fact one and the same. Um, be nice, be kind, stay safe, stay healthy. Hopefully I'll see you on Friday Night Live, Friday night, 7.30 p.m. on my YouTube channel and that about does it for me. Bye guys!